by Jesus on the cross, the people crying, looking on a man and thinking tragedy. But what this world could not see was when they nailed him to a tree. It would break the chains of sin, captivity. Love grew. Hi, my name is Darren Johnson. Welcome to our show. Now today we'll have a teaching on the book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel. In Ezekiel 1, 1 and 2 it says, Now it came to pass, in the thirtieth year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captive, by the rivers of Kibar, that the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. Verse 2, in the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity. Now Jehoiakim was the last king of Judah before the nation went into a 70-year Babylonian captivity. Look at 2 Chronicles 36, 9 to 10. Five years into the captivity, the Levitical priest Ezekiel saw visions of God. In Ezekiel 1, 3 and 4 it says, The word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest, the son of Uzziah, in the land of the Chaldeans, by the river Kibar. And the hand of the Lord was there upon him. Verse 4, And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the mist thereof as the color of amber, out of the mist of the fire. The river Kibar is in the land of the Chaldeans, who were known for their wisdom. Look at Daniel 1 verse 4. The book of Ezekiel starts in the 13th year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Look at Daniel 1 1. The prophet Ezekiel gets the word of the Lord. The visions begin with Ezekiel seeing a whirlwind, or something like a tornado, coming out of the north sky. Enfolding means the folding in of an outer layer so as to form a pocket in the surface. What we have here is God the Father coming to earth on his throne in a cloud, similar to like Acts 1-9 when Jesus left earth in a cloud. His throne is in a pocket surrounded by an amber or deep yellow fire that had a brightness about it. Ezekiel 1.5 says, Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. The four living creatures are the cherubims. Look at Ezekiel 10.20. And they had the likeness of a man. And their job was to carry and guard God's throne. Look at Ezekiel 1.25 and 26. Now I know I'm quoting a lot of verses here. But you know what, Christian? You need to know your Bible. And a lot of these quotes are from the Old Testament. Now, I have all the Old Testament prophets, verse-by-verse -verse commentaries with cross-references. You may need to look at a few of them to look up some things, to understand Ezekiel better, because all these things are connected in some way. You need to know your Bible, Christian. You need to know all the prophets. You need to know what they're there for and how it all fits together. I'm trying to help you. So download you all my books Old Testament verse by verse commentary. It's free in your price range. It'll help you out a lot. Take your time, study it, think it through, and God will give it to you if you seek Him out. Anyways, back to the lesson. Jesus is a living God of the spiritually living, and man is created in God's image. Christians serve a living God, not a dead one, like an idol. What separates Christianity from any other religion is that our God, Jesus, rose from the dead. His tomb is empty, Mark 12, 27. We serve a living God. Christians are alive spiritually in heaven and earth. And that's why the cherubims are living creatures. They represent the living Christianity. And by the way, the cherubims also guarded the tree of life in Genesis 3, 24. The tree of life, or eternal life, is now found in heaven. Now, had Mr. and Mrs. Adam ate of the tree of life, they would have gotten eternal life and would have never acquired a sin nature. But as the story goes, they didn't. 
And that's why God had to send the second Adam, which is Jesus Christ, who didn't sin, and hence became our Savior from sin. Ezekiel 1.6 says, And everyone had four faces, and everyone had four wings. What follows now is a description of the cherubims. The cherubims each have four wings and faces. Now remember, cherubims are heavenly creatures. God made the angels, he made the seraphims, he made the devils, he made Satan himself, he made the cherubims, he made the archangels. God made everything for his glory and purpose. And Christian, you need to know why they were created, what their function is, and how it fits together. Now, the four corners of the earth means everywhere on earth. God is everywhere for the Christian. And if you are lost, you can get saved anywhere. Isaiah 11, 12. Oh, by the way, when God says the four corners of the earth, he doesn't mean the earth is flat. You know, if you look in Isaiah chapter 40, I believe, it shows you that the earth is a circle. I mean, the earth is always round. Christianity always believed that. But the four corners of the earth is an expression. You know, for example, when you look at maps and they spread out the whole world, the whole world's on this flat surface, but we know the surface is a circle. So when you say the four corners, well, that covers the whole thing. Also, four is a picture of creation. Jesus is creator of the earth and is over the creation. Jesus is the cornerstone. The cornerstone is on top of the building whose foundation is on four corners, Mark 12, 10. Ezekiel 1, 7 says, And their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. The cherubim's feet were straight feet, not crooked feet. God is holy and without sin. He is straight. When you forsake your sin and do what God says, your crooked life will become straight or holy. Luke 3, 4, and 5. A calf is like an ox. It serves the owner or is a servant. Jesus was born to serve or to give to man, whether it be eternal life or the blessings of serving him on earth or in heaven. Brass is a picture of judgment. God is perfect, and he is the final judge on everything we do in life, whether good or bad. Ezekiel 1, 8, 9 says, And they had the hands of the man under their wings, on their four sides, and they four had their faces and their wings. Verse 9, their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. They went, everyone, straight forward. Cherubims look like men, with the addition of four wings and four heads. They turned not when they went, since a cherubim is always facing all four directions at once. Think about it. If you have four faces, on a horizontal view, you know, you're looking north, east, west, and south all at the same time. You don't have to turn around to see what someone's doing because you can see all four directions. By the way, God doesn't have to turn around to see what you're doing. Look at 2 Chronicles 16.9. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. God sees everything. He's omniscient. He doesn't miss anything. It's all on tape. You can't hide your sin from him. God sees every direction at once. Therefore, Christians ought to live pure all the time in thought and action because God is watching you. You know, the old saying, big brother is watching you. Well, God's watching big brother, and he's watching you. That's what you need to worry about. The guy in charge of the universe. You know, the guy that wrote the Bible, our final authority. All right? <laughs> Fear God and keep his commandments, for it is the whole duty of man. In Ezekiel 1.10 it says, As for the likeness of their faces, they forehead the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side, and they forehead the face of an ox on the left side. They for also had the face of an eagle. The cherubim had four faces, the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. This is the picture of the four faces of God or Jesus. In the book of Luke, we see an emphasis on Jesus' humanity or the face of a man. In the book of Matthew, we see an emphasis on Jesus as a king, or the face of a lion. In the book of Mark, we see an emphasis on Jesus as a servant, or the face of an ox. And in the book of John, we see the emphasis of Jesus as God, or the face of an eagle. I mean, the eagle flies into heaven, lakes. Face of God, get it? In Ezekiel 1, 11, it says, Thus were their faces, and their wings were stretched upward, Two wings of every one were joined one to another, 
and two covered their bodies. The wings of the cherubims were upward, joined, and covered. They were upward or pointing to heaven. That's why a Christian's affection should be upward. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Titus 2.12 And oh, by the way, Christian, you should always be heavenly minded. Don't fall for that anti-Bible philosophy that you're, that you're too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. That sounds like a carnal person who doesn't know their Bible. God's cherubims pointed upward because God wants our thoughts and affections to always be upward or heavenly or godly or holy. The wings were joined or unified and were in complete cooperation with each other. The locusts in Proverbs 30.27 were a picture of Christians. You know why? They cooperated together. They had no visible king, but they cooperated in wiping out the field and eating everything. And Christians, although we don't have a visible king, because our king is invisible to us, we cooperate to preach the gospel to all the world and then train them. Matthew 28, 18-20. Our king is Jesus, but he's not visible. We work together with one unified cause, or we should anyway, which is to reach the world with the gospel of salvation and teach others how to live godly. I said that twice to get your attention, Christian. Everything in the Bible that God created points to something about Jesus. Pay attention. The Old Testament is important. Yeah, I know we're not under Mosaic Law anymore. We're under the New Testament Church Covenant because Jesus died. But the things that were written aforetime were written for our learning. Look at Romans 15, 4. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, 6. They're written for our examples. Wake up, Christian. Don't throw away three quarters of your Bible because you're an idiot. Know the whole Bible from cover to cover. The wings of the cherubims covered their body. Christians should cover their bodies and not walk around naked. That's why Christians shouldn't wear shorts, cut off t-shirts, bikinis, so on and so forth in public. Listen, Christian, your nakedness, if you're a man, is for your wife. And if you're a wife, it's for your husband. Okay, it's for no one else. Don't walk around naked in public. That's a sin. I don't care what the world thinks, what they do. Do what God says. Cover yourself. Our bodies should be modestly covered, and our clothes should draw attention to our holy character, not our bodies. You know, Christian, a very simple rule on whether or not what you're wearing is okay. Does it draw attention to the character of God, or does it draw attention to your flesh or your body? If it's drawing attention to your flesh, you shouldn't be wearing it. And oh, by the way, if you're a man, you should be wearing man's clothing. And if you're a woman, you should be wearing woman's clothing. God has a very simple dress code. Cover yourself. Men look like men. Women look like women. It's pretty simple. Don't let the world mess you up, because they are pretty messed up. Ezekiel 1.12 says, And they went everyone straight forward. Whither the Spirit was to go, they went. And they turned out when they went. Cherubims followed the spirit that was in their wheels. So Christian should let the Holy Spirit within guide him in life and not his flesh. Look at Romans 8, 1 and 2. God saved us to sin no more and to live godly. You know, by the way, I have most of the New Testament, verse by verse commentary. Download my book of Romans and everything else to help you grow, Christian. You need to know your Bible. We live in a crooked and wicked generation. Their sin is obvious. The world shouldn't be influencing you at all. It should be the other way around, if anything. They don't have anything that you need spiritually. you got everything you need in the Bible. Ezekiel 1.13 says, As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, and like the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. The cherubims had a bright appearance. The Christian should live godly and openly proclaim to all the gospel of salvation. Matthew 5, 14 and 16. The Bible says, let your light so shine. Christian, don't hide it. Don't be ashamed of it. Let it shine brightly. You should be proud to serve the Lord. The Christian needs to shine brightly for God so all can see God's glory and power. Now, lightning in a rainstorm brings fear, and it is a picture of the judgment of God. Christians need to fear the Lord as well as reverence Him. 
Christians gain knowledge and wisdom when they fear the Lord. And by the way, Christian, you don't just reverence God. Okay? You fear and reverence. Fear means fear. Like he can take your breath away and kill you instantly. <laughs> you better do what he says. Reverence is more of a respect because of who God is. You do both. God is not some patsy in a Christmas costume, okay? He's a holy living God. He's not your fool. It's the other way around. He's in charge. He created the universe. He speaks. Things come to life. He says, die, and you die. We serve a living, almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing God who can judge the body and the soul in hell. Ezekiel 1.14 says, And the living creatures ran and returned, as the appearance of a flash of lightning. The cherubims ran and returned in a flash. Christians need to understand that God's business is urgent. Ephesians 5.16 You're not promised tomorrow, Christian. You only have today to serve the Lord. You know, it's possible you get hit by a truck today. Your life is over. It happens. Or some change of event in your life where your life changes, where you can't do certain things anymore. Welcome to the real world. You're not promised a perfect life till you're 89 and then you quietly die. It doesn't happen often. <laughs> if it happens to you, you're lucky. Wake up. God's business is urgent. Look at the apostles. With the except for one, they were all martyred. But the business was urgent. They preached the word with power and boldness. That's what you need to do while you're still breathing, and you can. Ezekiel 1.15 says, Now as I beheld the living creatures, behold one wheel upon the earth by living creatures with his four faces. Each cherubim had one wheel attached to their body. The wheel is a picture of one eternal God without beginning or end. Look at 1 John 5, 7. In Ezekiel 1, 16, it says, The appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of a barrel, and they four had one likeness, and their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. Barrel is a metal that is lightweight, has a high melting property, it doesn't rust, and is a reflector of light. For the Christian, we need to have a high melting property. That is a character to do right when the heat is on. We need to have a lightweight property or not be dragged down by any particular sin when serving the Lord wholeheartedly. When we serve the Lord, He will put His protective hedge around us so that the world and the devil can't ruin us or make our metal to rust. A Christian has no spiritual light of his own but he can reflect God's truth or light through witnessing, teaching, and preaching to others. The cherubim's wheel had a wheel in the middle of the wheel. Jesus is God, is the outer wheel, and God the Father is the inner wheel. Look at John 10, 30. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. The wheel you can see and the wheel you can't see. And of course, the Spirit was in the wheels. There's the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, the cherubim wheels. Outer wheel, inner wheel, spirit in the wheel. Get with the program, Christian. Read your Bible, know your Bible, practice your Bible. You watch too much television. That's your problem. But I digress. To get God the Father for the inner wheel, we must go to Jesus for the outer wheel. Look at 1 John 2, 1. Like the Father and the Son, both wheels work in unison. Ezekiel 1, 17-18 says, When they went, they went upon their four sides. And they turned out when they went. Verse 18, As for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful, and their rings were full of eyes round about them four. The eyes of the cherubims were in the rings of the wheel. God the Father and God the Son sees everything a person does, every second of his life. Even when Jesus was on the earth, he knew and saw all things. Look at John 1.48. God is everywhere, all the time. Our life is on tape, so we need to live like it. And oh, by the way, pervert, remember that the next time we get pornography. Your life is on tape. God sees everything you do. And Christian, you shouldn't be looking at pornography. That's wicked. The rings of the wheel were high and dreadful. God is worthy of our fear and reverence, for he is the almighty God of the universe. Look at Hebrews 12, 28 29. Ezekiel 1, 19 to 20 says, And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, 
the wheels were lifted up. Verse 20, whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went. Thither was the spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them. For the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. The cherubims followed the leading of the spirit. The spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. So the wheel of the cherubims is a picture of the Godhead, 1 John 5, 7. Jesus is the outer wheel, the Father is the inner wheel, and the Holy Ghost is in the wheels. Ezekiel 121 says, When those went, these went. And when those stood up, these stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over against them. For the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. The wheel and the cherubims move in unison, for they are driven by the spirit. By the way, God's word and God always move in unison, for God's word is above Jesus' name, according to Psalms 138, verse 2. You know, God's got to keep his word, otherwise he's a liar. God's under the authority of his word, otherwise he's a hypocrite. And God's not a sinner or a hypocrite. If your religion or your experience doesn't match the Bible, it's wrong. If your dreams don't match the Bible, it's wrong. You know, whatever your experiences or whatever goes on in your life, check it with the Bible. God never goes contrary to his word. And when I say the Bible, I mean the old King James for the English-speaking people. Not the NIV, ASV, or other kinds of toilet paper, but the old King James Bible. The Holy Spirit within the Christian will guide him into all truth according to the Bible, John 16, 13, and 14. The Holy Ghost, Jesus, and the Word of God all work together to glorify Jesus. The wheel is driven by the Spirit. A wheel guides or directs the car, bicycle, so on and so forth. God, the Trinity, guides the Christian in his life. Now, we will continue with our lesson on the book of Ezekiel, but now we're going to pause for a commercial. What does the Bible say about gay and lesbian marriages? Well, first of all, all through the Bible, marriage is between a man and a woman. It's never between a man and a man, or a woman and a woman. You know, the Bible says in Leviticus 18, 22, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. Hey, even the actual sexual practice was condemned all through the Bible. Now, a lot of people say, hey, look, we don't want religion in the courthouse. But listen, it's not religion that we want out of the courthouse. We want sin out of the courthouse. Hey, we've got enough corruption, okay? Now, in the Bible, just like any other sin, God judges the person who practices it and the nation that condones it. Now, we don't hate the sinner. We hate the sin, okay? Now, look, you've committed the act of sodomy or being gay or lesbian. Look, God can forgive you, but you need to repent of it and do what's right. Now, Christians, look, if God doesn't go for the act of being gay or lesbian, he's certainly not going to go for gay or lesbian marriages. We need to unite and stand against gay and lesbian marriages in the state of Louisiana and make a stand for God. Hey, it's God's way. It's the right way. It's the Bible way. Hi, my name's Darren Johnson, and I'd like you to have a free copy of my new book, The Test of Man and the Bible Through the Ages. Just go to my website at newlifelafayette.com and go to the link other selected works by Darren Johnson and download you a free copy or just read it off the computer. Hey, feel free to make a copy and distribute it freely to your friends. Now the purpose of this book is to show the reader that the Bible can be divided up into seven periods or ages. In each age, man's circumstance is different. Yet regardless of the circumstance, man as a race always falls short of God's standard. The Bible says in Romans 3, 4, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightst be justified in thy sayings, and mightst overcome when thou art judged. Hey, when the day of final judgment arrives, no lost person can point his finger at God and say, it wasn't fair, I never had a chance. Now the material presented in this book is not exhaustive. It just provides the reader a basic outline of what is going on in the Bible as well as making a few applications to Christian living today. 
I pray you'll get a blessing out of it. So go online and get your free copy today. All right, continue with our lesson on the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 122 says, And the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creature was as the color of the terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads above. God's throne was upon a firmament or a slab of crystal. This slab of crystal was upon the heads of the cherubims. Crystal is a symbol of God's purity or holiness. Hence the expression, it's crystal clear. The Bible teaches that the Christian should have a pure mind. Exodus 28, 36, and 37. If you can control your thoughts in your mind for good, you can control your actions for good. Look at 2 Corinthians 10, 5. I'll say it again. Christian, control your thoughts. You can control your actions. Control your thoughts for God. You'll serve God all the time. Where's your mind going? See, that's your problem. Think about it. A good way to control your imaginations and thoughts is to be careful what you read, watch on television, what you look at, what you listen to on the radio, so on and so forth. This is why I preach so hard against all these things. This is why I personally am strict on where I go, who I hang around, what I do in my spare time. It's all because it can't affect my imaginations and thoughts for good or for bad, which could affect my actions for good or for bad, and hence the amount of blessings I get from God. And I want God to bless me. Now, I know, Christian, you can't avoid all the bad things in the world, but if you're always practicing to do good and practicing self-control and controlling yourself and serving God, you'll be like Jesus. When you're around the sewer rats, you won't give in to sin, but you'll preach and stand boldly for God. Ezekiel 123 says, And under the firmament were their wings straight, the one toward the other. Everyone had two, which covered on this side, and everyone had two, which covered on that side, their bodies. The four wings of the cherubims covered their bodies. God's people are always covered when they're dressing right. Sin leads to nakedness, whereas righteousness leads to your body being covered. Ezekiel 124 says, And when they went, I heard the noise of their wings, like the noise of great waters, as the voice of the Almighty, the voice of speech, as the noise of an host. When they stood, they let down their wings. When the cherubims were flying, they made noise as the noise of speech. They were heard. As Christians, we shouldn't be ashamed to witness. We should be heard. That's why I'm on TV. That's why I have a website. That's why I give things away. That's why I tell you to distribute it as much and as fast as you want. Read the Bible, study the Bible, practice the Bible. Your voice needs to be heard for God. We need to be going into all the world, and our speech of the gospel of salvation needs to be heard. Jesus was always on the move, preaching the gospel of salvation and righteousness, Luke 4.22. He used gracious words. He had purity in speech. He had the voice of the Almighty. As Christians, we need to be more like Jesus in terms of living godly, having character, and having a pure mind and speech. In Ezekiel 125 and 26 it says, And there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads when they stood and had let down their wings. Verse 26, And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne, as the appearance of sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. God the Father sits on his throne in heaven. When God the Father came to earth directly, he came on his throne as king of the universe. In the Old Testament, the children of Israel built a tabernacle, which was a picture of the tabernacle in heaven. There was a hole in the tabernacle, on the top, of course, where God would go in as a cloud and dwell in the mercy seat in the most holy place, which was the innermost part of the tabernacle. Now, for more information on the tabernacle, download my teachings on Tabernacle Part 1 and 2. And I discuss the setup of the tabernacle, you know, where the hole is, where the mercy seat is, where God comes in, typology, why it's important, how it matches with heaven, so on and so forth. Look at Hebrews 8, 5, so on and so forth. But moving right along, on each side of the mercy seat, there were golden cherubims. And this was a picture of the cherubims that were around God's throne and carried it wherever God commanded. Look at 2 Samuel 6, verse 2. 
So the cherubims glorify and picture Jesus. They're always in God's presence. A cherubim is a living creature with wings, whereas an angel is a ministering spirit to save people, and they don't have wings. In Ezekiel 127 to 28, it says, And I saw as a color of amber, as the appearance of fire, round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward. I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about. Verse 28, as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake. The appearance of God the Father was a deep yellow fire that had fire all around. He has a bright appearance from his waist up and his waist down. In the Bible, God is a person like you and me. He's not some electrical force or a mysterious entity. The rainbow, or the appearance of the bow, was the appearance of God's brightness or God's glory. And oh, by the way, it is an abomination to God that the queers, or the homosexuals, have adopted the rainbow in their symbol. You know, you look in the Bible, Genesis chapter 9, the rainbow was never about the homosexual nation. God condemned homosexuality. Look at Leviticus 18.22 under Mosaic Law and Romans 1.27 under the New Testament Church Covenant. Christian, pastors, the church, the New Testament Church, has no place for the homosexual. They're wicked. They need to repent of their sin. They need to get saved. We don't embrace their sin. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah. A loving God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of sodomy. He had no tolerance for it. Christian, pastors, churches, you shouldn't have any tolerance either. If you are, you're in league with the devil. So the rainbow represents the glory of God the Father and also the covenant with Noah and God, which is Genesis 9, 16, 17. Remember that the devil always perverts what God has made good, John 8, 44. After Ezekiel sees the glory of God, he falls on his face in worship. In Ezekiel 2, 1 and 2, it says, And he said unto me, Son of man, stand upon my feet, and I will speak unto thee. Verse 2, And the Spirit entered into me, when he spake unto me, and set me upon my feet, that I heard him that spake unto me. The Spirit is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enabled Ezekiel to stand on his feet and hear what God has to say. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 2, 12. In Ezekiel 2, 3 and 5, it says, and he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me, even unto this very day. Verse 4, For they are impudent children, and stiff-hearted. I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. Verse 5, And they, whether they will hear, or whether they will forbear. For they are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there has been a prophet among them. Ezekiel is sent by God to the Jews under the Babylonian captivity. They are in this condition because of their great sins. Look at 2 Chronicles 36, 14 and 16. The nation of Israel is currently in the fifth year of King Zedekiah's reign, which, by the way, is the brother of King Nebuchadnezzar. Look at 2 Chronicles 36, 11 to 13. The nation of Judah was a rebellious nation against God. Look at Psalms 9.17. And they were rebellious against his word. Look at Psalms 19.7. Impotent means the quality of being offensively bold, and stiff-hearted means hard-hearted. These are the typical left-wing, anti-God, anti-Bible crowd of our day. These people are for abortion on demand, contrary to Exodus 20.12. They're for queer marriage. They're for homosexual marriage, contrary to Romans 27, Leviticus 18, 22. They're going to do what they want, and they're going to do what they want no matter what. A lot of these people have reprobate minds, where their mind is seared. Of course, not all of them are like that. There's still hope for some of them, and those are the ones we have to reach, Christians. But these perverted liberals will kick and scream until they get their way, or try to bring everyone down with them in the process. 
and that's why Christians we need to stand. You know, we need to stand in the civil arena. It's important who you vote for. It's important to know your candidates. It's important to know which candidates stand for your constitution and for basic morality and for good economy, so on and so forth. Otherwise, these liberals will destroy everything. On the side, I mean, look at the illegal immigration problem. Why do you think your health care costs are going up? Why do you think the cost of living is going up? Why do you think there's no good jobs around anymore? There's a lot of low-paying jobs, so on and so forth. You bring in 50 million people, they got to go somewhere. Someone's got to pay for them. And that's where taxes come in. You know, bad policies, destroys economy. I mean, you get the idea. And one thing about liberals, their economic policies are always disastrous. They only tax more so they can spend more. And they usually spend more than they tax until the whole thing blows up in bankruptcy and disaster. And they always blame and shame others who disagree with them. Don't fall for that, Christian. But I digress. The liberal wants their right to be irresponsible and their right not to pay for it. Romans 3, 14 to 18. Ezekiel's job is to preach the word to the people of Israel. Whether they listen to the word of the Lord is up to them. How they react to the message is up to them. Look at Luke 13, 3. Ezekiel's success is in obeying God. John 14, 15. Not running a thousand or more in a church on Sunday. 1 Timothy 6, 5. You know, the greatest destruction to the modern American church is that their focus is on bigger offerings, bigger attendance, more prestige, rather than righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Romans 14, 17. Look, just because you get a thousand reprobates in a building doesn't mean that God's with you. It just means that you're popular. All right? Popular doesn't equate into holiness. Keeping God's commandments and the power of God equates in holiness, regardless how many you're running. But in spite of the obvious, men thinking, men of corrupt minds think gain is godliness. And so we have the circus of religion known as American Christianity. In Ezekiel 2, 6 and 7 it says, And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee. And thou dost dwell among scorpions, be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. Verse 7, And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. A briar is a tangled mass of prickly plants. A scorpion is a venomous arachnid, and they are relatives to the spider. When a scorpion stings you, he will inject you with his poisonous venom. The point here is that hard times are ahead for the prophet Ezekiel. He's going to a people who don't want to hear the word of God, 2 Timothy 4, 2. Nor repent, Luke 13, 3. Now a good analogy is this ministry of Ezekiel is equivalent to a street preacher going to Mardi Gras in Louisiana or any homosexual parade in America. People don't want to hear it, and they openly mock God with their attitudes and their ways and their beliefs. A Christian, you've got to preach the truth anyway. And see, that's why I'm on television. That's why I preach against this stuff and everything else. This is how I reach to most people, as cheaply and as efficiently as possible. That's why I have free downloads, so you can read it and pass it on as freely and cheaply as possible. So the Word of God spreads like wildfire, and that it gets to everyone who wants it and needs it. Anyways, the people of Judah and Israel are openly rebellious. Now, dismayed means to be struck with fear and to cause to lose an enthusiasm, or be disillusioned. The nations of the Jews are afraid of the future. They are not excited about God or his message of repentance. Nevertheless, Ezekiel must preach it. Most churches in America would not promote repentance. Did you know that most churches in America would not promote a ministry like this? Because it is not effective. It's costing the church money. It's not bringing anyone to church. It's offending people. Look, God's not interested in your opinion. He's interested in you doing what you're supposed to. You want godly results? You've got to do it God's way, in God's power, in God's timing, in God's will. You've got all sorts of nonsense. This is why most churches don't understand the book of Ezekiel. 
nor teach in-depth studies on it because it goes against their false view of God and the ministry. Look at 2 Timothy 3.16 and Romans 15.4. Ezekiel 2.8 and 10 says, But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious, like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth, and eat that I give thee. Verse 9, And when I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. Lament means to cry of sorrow and grief. Woe means misery resulting from affliction. Ezekiel is commanded to eat a book that is full of lamentations, woe, and mourning. John the Apostle was also given a book to eat. Look at Revelation chapter 10, verse 8 and 11. God's word, the Bible, is also referred to as a Christian's spiritual food. 1 Peter 2.2 2. When the word of God is digested and applied to your life, you will get persecuted. 2 Timothy 3.12 And it will cause you bitterness in this life. However, don't fret, but glorify God that you are worthy to suffer for him. 1 Peter 4.13-16 In Ezekiel chapter 3, 1-3 it says, Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest. Eat this roll, and go speak unto the house of Israel. Verse 2, So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. Verse 3, And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. The word of God was sweet in the mouth of Ezekiel, like it was with John the Apostle. Look at Revelations 10.10. 10. God's word is a blessing when you understand it and reap the benefits of it in this life. It will also be a blessing in eternity when you reap the benefits of it as well. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.10. After the eating, Ezekiel was to go preach to the house or nation of Israel what was nourishing him. Look at Matthew 4.4. Remember that under the Babylonian captivity, the nation of Judah and Israel are referred to as one nation again. By the way, before the modern printing press, the Word of God was written on lambskins and rolled up around a properly sized pole. Ezekiel 3, 4, and 6 says, And he said unto me, Son of man, go get thee unto the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. Verse 5, For thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech, and of a hard language, but to the house of Israel. Verse 6, Not to many people of a strange speech, and of a hard language, whose words thou canst not understand. Surely, had I sent thee to them, they would have hearkened unto thee. The people of Israel speak the same language, as well as have the same culture as Ezekiel. There are no barriers here for the word of God to go forth, other than the sins of the house of Israel. The prophet Ezekiel is sent to his own people to let them have it with the word of God. This is similar today as God calling a pastor to take over an existing New Testament church that isn't right with God and that church doesn't want to change. The message of Ezekiel is so powerful and obvious that if he had been a missionary to a foreign country, they would have repented and had a revival. Nevertheless, God wanted the Ezekiel to still go to the house of Israel to preach the word. Now, for those of you backslidden Christians and pastors who are numbers oriented, Rather than obedience-oriented, verse 6 rebukes you. God deliberately sent Ezekiel to Israel knowing that they wouldn't repent. But he sent them anyway because they needed to hear the truth. Don't get me wrong. God wants all to be saved. 2 Peter 3.9 And I have seen multitudes saved and reached with the word of God with my ministry. However, I don't let the results direct my ministry. I let the holiness direct my ministry. I let the truth and the preaching of the Word of God direct my ministry. If God tells me to do something, I do it. Whether it's financially profitable, whether it's popular, I do it anyway. Because that's what God commands. The Word of God and the leading of God directs my ministry regardless of the results. John 16, 13-15. Ezekiel 3, 7-9 says, But the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they will not hearken unto me. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. 
Verse 8, Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces, and thy forehead strong against their foreheads. Verse 9, As an adamant, harder than flint, have I made thy forehead. Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious heart. The Bible teaches that when you desire God's word, you will soften your heart to receive it. When you reject God's word, it will make your heart harder so you can't receive it. So Ezekiel is told by God that before his ministry gets started, his message will be rejected because the people of Israel are offensively bold against God and hard-hearted. <laughs> Sounds like your typical liberal and Democrat of our day. They hate God's word. The hate that it preaches against evolution, gay marriage, abortion. It hates that it preaches against wickedness and fornication and adultery. It hates when it teaches personal accountability and responsibility with individuals as well as government. So on and so forth. Yes, my friend, the Bible rebukes you. If you're wicked, it makes no exception for anyone. However, God empowers Ezekiel with a forehead that is adamant. You know, like a hard substance, like flint, which is a particular type of hard stone. He's given a strong face that can face off or stand up to the open rebels of the nation of Israel. Ezekiel is commanded not to fear the people or their actions. By the way, a good street preacher today in the liberal parts of America, or at your typical drunken festivals, like all of them in America, in this country, will have all the same characteristics. God hasn't changed. The devil hasn't changed. His message hasn't changed. People say God haven't changed. And Christian, we don't change for the world. We preach the truth. God empowers according to the ministry he gives you for his glory. Forget about being a celebrity. Forget about being popular. You focus on holiness and preaching the word of God. You'll be popular and a celebrity with God. That's all that counts. And usually, if the world likes you, God hates you. And if God loves you, the world's going to hate you. Because the world hates God. They're rarely in agreement. I hope that teaching was a blessing to you. However, if you're lost and not saved, when you die, you'll go to hell and then the lake of fire. But if you'd like to escape hell and the lake of fire, I'm going to take some time right now and show you how you can be 100% sure when you die, you can go to heaven. I'm going to show you how to go to heaven. Now, the first thing on how to go to heaven is knowing that you're a sinner. Now, we'll start with this picture right here. Now, sin makes you dirty on the inside. You know, the Bible says that the thought of foolishness is sin. You ever made a dirty thought? Made a wicked thought? Made you feel dirty on the inside? Well, that's what sin will do. Sin is when you break God's law. Do you ever disobey your parents? Well, the Bible says, uh, honor thy father and thy mother. So kids, you ever do what's wrong? Well, hey, that's a sin. You ever uh, steal before? The Bible says, thou shalt not steal. Anyway, sin is when you break God's law and it'll make you guilty on the inside. Hey, we've all sinned, okay? I sin, you sin. The Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Once you recognize you're a sinner, then you need to recognize God has to punish sin. Now, why do parents punish their kids? For being bad, right? Well, why would God punish you? Same reason. Now, you notice there's two places where a person can go, either the heaven or the lake of fire. Okay. Now, why would a person go to the lake of fire? The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. Okay. God has to be just and punish our sins, just like you have to punish your kids when they're bad. But, the Bible says, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God provides a way to heaven, and that's through Jesus. Now, what did Jesus do on the cross? He died for our sins. Now, the Bible says that in 1 John 5, 20, it says, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. So Jesus, he's the Son of God, he's God, and he's eternal life. So we have to go to God, the one who died on the cross, was buried, and rose from the dead three days later, 
for our sins for forgiveness. Now, another thing you need to do is you need to repent. You need to turn to God from your sins. The Bible says, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Now, these people right here, who do you think God could forgive? Well, they've got a change of heart. He doesn't have a change of heart. That's what repentance is. It's, turn, it's a change of heart towards God. You want to change this, okay? Yeah. When you want to change, then God can forgive you. You can't be sorry that you just got caught, okay? You gotta be sorry and want to change, okay? Then once you have a repentant heart, let me show you what to do next. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 7, that it's the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, that cleanses us from all sin, okay? Now, what God wants to do, he wants to forgive all of your sin. He wants to forgive your past sin, your present sin, and your future sin once for all by his blood. Now, so once all your sins are forgiven, hey, where would you go? Heaven. Hey, if my past sins and my present sins and my future sins are all gone, I'm going to heaven. And then the Bible says that when we get forgiven, that the Spirit of God comes in. And when we, have spirit, uh, when we have the Spirit of God within us, we know we're saved. The Bible says in Ephesians 1.13, that in whom ye also, I'm sorry, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Okay? You know, when you get sealed by God's Spirit, it's like being born into God's family. Now, when you got born, you were born into a bloodline, right? Now, does that ever change? Of course not. Once you're born to a bloodline, it's forever. Well, in the same way, once you're born into God's bloodline, He seals you, it's forever. It's eternal. It will never change. Now notice, it's not by good works. Now don't get me wrong, God wants you to be good, okay? After you're saved, He wants you to go to church. He wants you to get baptized. He wants you to read the Bible. He wants you to pray. He wants you to do what's right. But works will never save you. Hey, were you born into your family's bloodline because you were good? No. You were born that way. Hey, if you do something bad, can you be unborn out of your family's bloodline? No. It never changes. It's eternal. See, the Bible says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration, and renewing of the Holy Ghost, okay? The blood washes us clean, the Spirit of God comes in, we are saved forever, okay? Now, if you would like to have all your sins forgiven, this is what you gotta do, okay? Now, if you would like to be forgiven, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pray out loud like I want God to forgive me, and if you wanna be forgiven, you just pray along and just ask God to forgive you, okay? Now, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Anyone can do it anywhere. You just got to mean it in your heart, okay? Now, if you're just going to laugh and not be serious, you'll be like this guy. But if you're serious and you want to change and trust his blood only, he can save you. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to bow my head. I'm going to pray out loud like I want God to forgive me. And I'll say a few words. I'll pause. Then you can pray, and I'll say a few more words, you can and then I'll pause, you can pray, and you can ask the Lord to save you, okay? So let's bow our heads. If you want to be saved, let's pray. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I deserve to go to the lake of fire, but I want to change. Please forgive me of all my sins by your blood once for all so I can go to heaven. Amen. Now, if you ask God to forgive you, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You are saved forever. You have eternal life. Okay? What does the Bible say? about abortion? Look, abortion is plainly murder. 
You know, God always recognized a person in the womb. If you look at Genesis 25, verse 23, the Bible said, And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. You know, now, if it's a person in the womb, and it's not a fetus, and we kill it, it's plainly murder. And you know, in the Ten Commandments, the Bible says, Thou shalt not kill. Now, look, a lot of people say, look, I'm tired of people putting their morals on me, you know, in society. But look, we don't want to get religion out of our morals in society. We want to get sin and unrighteousness out of our morals in society. The Bible says that sin is a reproach to any people. Now, we don't hate the sinner. We hate the sin. Look, you've committed abortion. Look, God can forgive you. He loves you. He still wants to save you. You can still serve him. But you just got to put it behind you and just do what's right. Okay? Now, Christians, look, abortion is murder. Now, Christians, we need to unite in the state of Louisiana against abortion. You know why? It's God's way. It's the right way. It's the Bible way.